uh, say, uh, Paul, say it again so I don't have to look at my, my text. All right, 15315. Uh, one, 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 five, three, one, five, one, five, three, one, five, or 15315. And what about Eagles today? Uh, that's 16. <laughs> one, three, sorry, 15316. Yeah. Oh, this is so funny. I just sank in the chair here. So. Okay. But you can see me okay, right? Yeah. Yeah, you're looking handsome with a jacket today. Wow, look at you. Oh, yeah. I, I was, uh, I'm down, I'm actually in. Can you guess where I am today? Yeah. You're, you you look like you're in a city commissioner's office in Dallas. Uh, yes, exactly right. That's where <laughs> I was today, uh, seeing all the commissioners and all that. We, uh, they were happy that I'd won some award or something. So they uh, were, uh, uh, talking about it, so I'm caught up with the health commissioner as well, the uh, health commissioner as well for the county, and had a good day so far. So. Well, uh, before we start, what what award was it? You want to let us know? Oh, they were just, they were just uh, congratulations on the uh, the best paper recognition that we got at ASAP last week. You know, that's all. Oh, the heads up CPR. Yeah, yeah, because it was out, came out in Medscape, so somebody saw it and they whatever wanted to. Since it said Dallas County, they wanted to sort of recognize that. That's all. Very so. nice. All right. Well, congrats, congratulations on that. Um, okay. Okay. So let's uh, let's get started. I know we are recording, so just uh, Stephen, so you know that we are recording. Um, today, th this is a, a a very important topic that I think um, you know. I'm I'm fortunate that. In, in the EMS community, we have people who are doing great work, and when you ask them to come present, they, they, they tend to say yes. And uh, today's guest is, is no different. Um, so uh, Stephen Murray uh, is from the Boston area. He's got a master's in public health. He's a paramedic. Uh, your rank, Stephen, is uh, one of uh, lieutenant chief. What are you? Uh, I was a lieutenant uh, before I retired, yeah. OK. Which department were you in? Uh, Northern Berkshire EMS, so in yeah. uh, West, Western Massachusetts, we're a regional agency. No, no, well, I have friends in Greenfield. So. Okay, I actually I went to paramedic school in Greenfield, so. Uh, okay, and you know the place that used to be Old Town Library, it's now kind of a, a museum of sorts for, uh, a, 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 uh, let's say, keyboard instruments. Here. Uh, we'll talk later, but it's kind of fun. I'll tell you more about it later. Uh, did I hear you were in Dallas as well? I am in Dallas today. Yes, we, we, we probably we probably crossed paths. I just got back yesterday. I was at the conference as well. At the police conference, was it? Or, yeah. yeah, yeah. I presented. I presented on uh, Sunday. Ah, okay, got it. Well, thank you so much then for your uh, support and help. Okay, really appreciate that. It's great. Oh yeah, so uh, excellent, Stephen. Thank you so much. So Stephen is is a researcher, and the, the title of his recently published paper, which caught my eye, was. Caring for people who use drugs, best practices for EMS providers. And I just came out of a chief's meeting here in my department, and we were talking about how really in EMS uh, now and into the future, uh, we're going to see a lot of mental health issues and a lot of addiction issues. So unless we kind of refocus on, on how we think about this, uh, we're going to be in a lot of trouble. And so this is a perfect time, Stephen, for you to talk about uh, your paper and your thoughts. So. We're going to give you the microphone and uh, take it away. Thanks for joining us. Sure, thanks. Uh, I'm going to actually share my screen. Because I, I need to be, uh, you guys see that okay? Yep, perfect. I need to I need to keep myself on track, so I do use PowerPoint. So um, thanks for the introduction and, and for inviting me. Um, this is a, a good forum for this. I haven't actually gotten the chance to speak to many EMS groups yet about this project in this paper, so you guys are kind of a pilot for me. Um, so thanks for inviting me. Um, as it was said earlier, I work for Boston Medical Center. I'm an overdose researcher. I'm also an overdose survivor and person long term recovery. I've been um, in recovery for 11 years uh, for both opiates and amphetamines. Um, and I wanted to give you guys my Florida connection since we're in Florida today. Um, Florida is where I was using drugs. So I uh, was a student at the uh, University of Miami back in from 2007 until 2011. That's me pretending to graduate in 2011. Um, I actually was uh, handed an empty diploma like everybody else uh, on that day, except I wasn't actually finished. I was far behind. I had uh, fallen into pretty deep addiction. 
a couple months later, I ended up in rehab. Um, and when I was in early recovery, I was looking for something to do. And I had no idea what I was going to do with my life at that point. And so I became a volunteer firefighter. And that was actually my pathway towards like a healthy recovery and um, eventually went on to become an EMT and then a paramedic uh, and served uh, almost a decade um, in Western Massachusetts. So that's sort of my background. So uh, the paper that I wrote is actually about a training that I created as part of my master's in public health. Uh, it's a practicum project. And what I did was I took uh, a mix of my personal and professional experience. So personal experience as a person who used drugs, um, and my background in the harm reduction world, um, I, I also didn't mention I'm on the Massachusetts Harm Reduction Advisory Council. I work on the Drug Checking Advisory Board uh, for New England um, and uh, do a lot in the sort of national harm reduction uh, movement. And so I, I mixed these, these ideas together uh, and then I, I mixed in my professional experience because for a lot of my uh, EMS career, the people that I worked with both pre-hospitally and in the hospital um, had no idea that I was in recovery. And so I, I saw a lot of things sort of through an unfiltered lens um, as to how my, my colleagues thought and felt um, about people who use drugs, how they spoke about them uh, when they thought nobody was listening. Um, and that all stopped when I came out. Uh, so I'm glad that I waited a while to start talking about it because I actually got to see kind of what was going on and where stigma was. And then also um, I spent a, a significant amount of my career working in, in CQI, doing uh, quality improvement. Uh, and so looking at reports, looking how people uh, had documented uh, what had happened and what they were doing. And so this this training really, um, really is a, just a, an outpouring of that. So the paper that uh, the doctor is referring to uh, is, is this one. It was published in Health Promotion Practice. Uh, they have a section that's called Practice Notes, and it's actually for interventions that are not finished and don't have data, um, where you basically publish a process paper. Um, I, I can send it to anybody who's interested. Just feel free to send me an email. I can send it along to you. Um, and this paper really only talks very, it's a brief paper. It has to be under a thousand words. And it it uh, just talks about the process of developing the training, sort of the, the assessment of need, the introduction of why I thought this was an important paper or important project to do. Um, and so, that was published and had a really good reception actually, um, which to me has indicated that this is an area I think as was alluded to where we need to be talking more about this. People are interested in the topic. Um, it got scored in the top 5% of research and, and it really is just a short paper about, about a project. Um, so I think that we have a lot of work to do in this space. The way the training is being evaluated is through a post pre-survey. So instead of giving someone a survey in the beginning and one at the end, um, you don't. You only survey once at the end, uh, which uh, is the theory. That there's a theory of that if you survey people only at the end, uh, you help to get rid of this idea that people don't know what they don't know. So if you ask somebody how they felt. Uh, before and they don't actually have a context for it, they're going to try to guess an answer and guess the answer that you want them to hear. Whereas at the end, they may be more uh, open about like sort of how they feel now versus how they felt before and they rate sort of how their knowledge, beliefs, and attitudes change over time. So this is just a sample of uh, the questions. I think there's like 30 something questions, but this is just an example um, where people would be asked. Uh, so if I see someone I work with mistreating a person who uses drugs, I will speak up. So a lot of people in the sort of preliminary research would say sort of neutral or disagree. Um, most of those folks have now moved into the agree or strongly agree category. Um, I plan on starting to do like a real analysis at 100 evaluations. Um, one of the hard parts is that uh, to get people to, the, people will take the class, but they are able to, to opt out of doing the survey. It's an IRB requirement by our institution. So um, I've had Quite a few more people take the class than do the survey, but um, we're, we're getting there about halfway, um, and we only launched about a month and a half ago. So, pretty happy with that so far. So, I'm just going to include two quick examples to sort of show you what the training was about and kind of how it was structured. So, uh, what I did was I looked at ways where I saw that things were happening one way uh, that for, for a certain group of patients and not another way for another group. So my classic example is that for anyone who works in EMS, you know that like probably our number one medication, at least here in Massachusetts that we give out is uh, Zofran. Um, and so 
we give Zofran to everybody, abdominal pain, you know, they get pain medication, they're nauseous, they get it. I mean, we, we give it out like candy, they do in the ED as well. Um, but I really rarely saw anyone ever give Zofran to somebody after an overdose. Um, and after an overdose, when you're in withdrawal, one of the main sort of symptoms of early withdrawal and maybe too much Narcan is that they're vomiting. And then so I would ask my medics who worked under me, uh, why didn't you give Zofran? And they would say, well, I didn't have an IV on them. And so I said, well, you know, we can give Zofran PO or IM as well. And so this kind of, this is a constant theme in this presentation is that one of the main excuses I've, I've heard across the board is that we didn't get an IV, their veins were bad, you know, I, I missed. Um, and that was sort of justification for not giving pain medication or um, giving anti-nausea uh, medication or, or, or whatever. And so in every example that I give on how to sort of improve the level of care, I talk about the alternative routes of administration or, or alternative medications that could be given in that situation. This is a case, it's actually a real case. Um, the second slide is gonna show you actually how I handled the case, but this is actually something that I saw quite often, which was that patients that were potentially paramedic level patients were downgraded to their BLS partner um, because they were a person who used drugs. So. Uh, in this case, this, this person had a uh, uh, really bad injection wound uh, on their arm. The, they were in severe pain. The medic decided that it wasn't uh, an ALS call and handed it over to the BLS partner. And so what happens to that person? You know, nothing is done on the way to the hospital. When they get there, they end up in the waiting room or in a, an express room. Um, and the patient could just walk away. They could leave without being seen. Um, they feel like they were treated poorly, they may uh, just walk out. And so, you know, what does that do? Well, they could have a significant delay of, uh, of treatment or diagnosis of a serious condition. And so in this case, um, this was an actual case that I had um, where a young woman had been reusing syringes and it caused significant uh, forearm arm wounds. Um, and so, you know, how did I look at that? Well, she she actually was in severe pain. So what did I do? Well, I actually couldn't get an IV on her because both of her arms were in bad shape. So I gave her IM ketamine at one milligram a kilogram. That made her much more comfortable. She said, thank you. She stopped screaming. Uh, she was um, in much better shape. And that allowed me to actually then go on to do other stuff with her because now she was comfortable. So um, once she was uh, comfortable, I was able to then do a full set of vitals and I found that she was febrile. And so what did that do? That opens up the cascade to start talking about or thinking about like, is this person septic? And she happened to meet all sepsis criteria basically that we had laid out in the state, which made me work a little bit harder to find an IV access point, which I did, started some saline, and I called in a sepsis alert. And so what happens then when that, per that person or that patient gets to the hospital? Well, you know, they're going to be treated much differently. They're coming in as a sepsis alert. There's been stuff that has been done. They've had pain management that has been started. Uh, and so a, a physician in, in my hospital, if you come in with a sepsis alert, the physician will generally meet you at the door to have a discussion. So that patient was seen right away. She ended up in the ICU. Um, she did make a full recovery. She was initiated on Suboxone at discharge, and she actually has been... Um, in recovery for two years. She just had a very healthy baby girl. Uh, I was able to go to her um, her baby shower and she's doing really well. And so, you know, this is just a really good, feel good case, but this is sort of like the standard of care that I would try to demand of our, our medics. So that's all, I'm, I, I think I only had 15 minutes. So I'm gonna end it here. Um, if you wanna check out the training, you can do so at this uh, link. Uh, keep in mind that it is case sensitive. So, uh, PU, PWUD, so people who use drugs, EMS 22. Um, feel free to reach out to me by email or on Twitter. I'm happy to write back and have a discussion. Uh, and I'm going to stop sharing so I can see wait, people. Wait, wait. Before you stop sharing, let, let me, I'm going to type that. Uh, actually, can you put it back up? I'm going to put it up. I'm going to put that into the chat. Yes. Only because I know that um, a lot of us are. There's so a tinyurl.com forward slash. P W D E M S twenty two, right? Yes. Did I get it right? Uh, I can't. For some reason, I can never see the chat on Teams because our institution won't let us like have a sign in, and so I I can't. So if anyone has written me in the chat, please feel free to uh, unmute yourself so I can see you, and uh, we can I can okay. answer any questions you might have. Awesome. Well, uh, Stephen, obviously you're you're 
not only passionate, but I did not know your history with, um, you know, with, with the drug use and the fact that you were able to kind of be on the inside hearing what people were saying about people, the person that you, you were, right, and how it impacted you. And you actually said, hey, I'm going to do something about it and I'll educate the rest of us. Uh, so I think there's a lot of power in what you're doing. Uh, you're a great speaker. And I think that, you know, th this is a message that needs to be um, kind of spoken at every firehouse across this country. Um, I would love to hear what um, what some folks have to say on this call. You have a lot of people here. You have people from um, from the state of Florida. You have people from um, Canada, uh, from the federal government are on this call who are listening to you from the state of Florida as well. Um, and is this something that you would say that we could just take that URL and have our folks take it? How long is that training? Can you just give us a little bit more detail on that and then I'll let Dr. Pepe come in. Sure, it's um, it's an hour um, and it was approved only for Massachusetts OEMS uh, credit. However, if someone from the state of Florida is here and you think that that training matches your protocols without any editing, feel free to issue a Florida um, I'm not sure how you guys do your your research there, but to, if you could, um, or if you're able, you know, yeah, issue sure. a Florida uh, OEMS credit. Um, I have been in talks with some other states about adapting it to their state protocols, um, and it's not that big of a deal to do. What I would want to do if if places were interested would be to to, to give it um, once live and have it recorded. And then um, you could continue to issue it out um, asynchronously for your state instead of like doing what I did, which is like create this whole recorded training, which was quite time consuming. I would rather just deliver it live if, if other states are interested in doing that. Um, so I'm open for that. Um, but if, if if it seems to match your protocols close enough that you're OK with with issuing that credit to the, the folks in your state, I'm also happy for you to do that. And I can actually amend the final certificate um, if needed. So. I haven't had any states take me up on that offer yet, but you guys are only like the third place I've talked to, so. Yeah, no, I, I think you get a lot of traction. Dr. Pepe may have some great insight. Go ahead, Dr. Pepe. Well, first of all, my uh, reaction at first is that a lot of times we see people when they're really been down and, you know, the picture can be shown of some people, for example, and then what they look like when they recovered or if you look at them before they did. So what I'm getting at is that we encounter people probably in their worst situation, number one. Number two, I betcha that everybody on this phone knows someone that's either close to them or pretty close to them that actually had such a problem and or is having such a problem uh, at this moment in time and um, I, I can personally say that through my life i've had cousins i've had best friends or you know pretty close to being best friends kind of people that uh, got there fortunately in some cases they recovered in other cases they did not and met their death and uh, so I think all of us know that. I want to put that in perspective. If you know those kinds of people that were close to you, what they were like before they got addicted, um, keep that in mind as you approach someone on the streets. Yeah. Everybody is a human being and they got there somehow because of some reason and all that. And we're into this to take care of people, C-A-R-E, not manage them or treat them. Okay, how's that? Great, Paul, thank you so much. You know, the, the question is, is how do we take somebody with your your insight and experience and Stephen's history and experience and translate it to our very new green paramedics who quite frankly are a different generation. We can all agree with that. They're younger. They're they, they don't have that uh, interpersonal skill. Um, and there is uh, they they may kind of go into these situations just like that perfect sepsis case was beautiful because you know, how many things are we missing because we're anchoring on some other off. diagnosis? Right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. OK, thank you, Peter. That's a great insight. I don't know the answer to that question right away, except there be a role model and uh, as best we can. So. Well, no, well, so that, that I, I would say that if Stephen created a one hour thing that everyone can do and, you know, normally things like this take, you know, four hours, eight hours, you got to all gather into a room. But I, what I'm wondering is, if after someone takes this course, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. With credit or without credit, whatever, that's not the important part at this point for me. But it's how do we then evaluate, did it make a difference? So Stephen, back to you then, are you are you actually looking pre and post as far as the, the actions 
being taken on medics in X department. You know, let's say before they weren't getting any Zofran, and now they're now now that we we've doubled the amount of Zofran. Like, are you are you able to look at real world data before and after? I think that would be an interesting thing. So that would be like a next phase. So with with stigma training, there's always the risk that what you're doing uh, worsens people's perceptions uh, of the sort of marginalized population. And so my intention was to have this initial initial training go out, see if it made a difference for people, and sort of from my preliminary look, it seems to be doing that. And and then once I have the sort of basis that the, the this type of training and, and, and such works, I would hope to then do it on a scale that you're talking about, which would be to like pick a state or pick a department, um, institute the training, and then see what the sort of before and after uh, effect would be. Um, it would have to probably be a, a large department uh, to get the kind of the data that we're looking for or, or like a countywide system or something like that. Um, but yeah. I think that's absolutely the next step after I if I can prove that this works. Um, yeah, well, I'll tell you what, you know, um, I'm with Palm Beach County Fire Rescue as well. Big, big agency. We, we run about 160,000 calls a year. Um, we have about 1500 paramedics. And um, we sure we sure do see a lot of, you know, patients who um, who are in that category. And um, so anyway, I would be interested in 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 floating on some education. We have great data collection ability. Um, so I'd, I'd be interested in doing that. I would love to hear from you have really, some really smart people on this phone call. Anyone have any other thoughts about for Stephen as to what what could be done or what how we in florida can maybe utilize what he's created uh, any, anybody uh, want to unmute their microphone and give some words of advice <clears throat> this is terry cohen hey terry you know it's been my general perception that communication skills are gradually deteriorating over time as people become more and more used to uh, social networking uh, on, on uh, platforms and people aren't very good at talking face to face anymore. So you know, it's something we really need to focus on. Yeah. Uh, and that's what Terry said because I think it's so appropriate and, and often we've learned to be mean spirited that way because you can get away with it. You couldn't say it face to face with the people. Or you make, you know, whatever innuendos or whatever that are just unkind, you know, that kind of thing. So, Terry, I absolutely agree with you. Thanks, Terry. John, you want to say a couple words? Thank you for coming Peter, up. This is interesting. It's, it's easy for me to say because I'm not in Florida and I'm not involved with your chapter, although these programs are great. I'm, I'm wondering, and I'm going to follow up with Stephen uh, with some other ideas for Michigan. But I'm wondering if this is something that the Florida NAEMSP chapter could certainly share with its members, maybe working through your assistant secretary of health, um, make it something that EMS does as a community education program. Right, that, that that's the kind of ideas I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about um, because we spend so much money, the state of Florida and all across the country, they throw so much money towards um, services for for addiction and so forth, but we, we kind of forget we, we've forgotten about just some of the basics of care, like Paul said, and treatment and and respect. Um, and so Stephen, who uh, Dr. Kramer is talking about, is um, Dr. Shepke, who is basically the number two guy for the state of Florida. He's a deputy secretary of, of health. Um, and, and he he has been a champion of this cause for much longer than any of us have been on this call, maybe besides you. He's even gotten to the point where he's open this, he's converted an entire ER so that all the patients who kind of fit this category, instead of them going to a random emergency department, we transport them there where they get the care that they deserve by people who know how to treat them and they can get initiated on Suboxone like you had mentioned in your story. Um, and we have, we have, so we, we, we do have people at the state level who care about this topic, 
And I think this is just another angle of importance so that we actually can treat these people with dignity and respect. And actually, like Paul, uh, Dr. Pepe had mentioned, Ken has a picture of a guy who is at the bottom of the barrel. And because he was treated well by EMS and, and kind of he got back on the tracks within three weeks, he's cleaned, he's shaven, he's you know back in his apartment again, and he got his life back, like the story you mentioned with that patient that you, you visited and just had a baby, right? So sometimes all it takes is one person in the back of an ambulance to make that happen. And um, so I think that this, this the, what you're talking about has, I think, big implications because it doesn't cost any money. And it just it just takes people to align the department with this is how we treat people. Right. Uh, so I, I, I love it. Um, we only have a couple minutes left. Any other final comments or, or any? Um, Stephen, if, if people wanted to reach out to you, what's the what's the best way? Oh, before we do that, Dr. Kim Landry from the Panhandle. Kim, go ahead. Hey, yeah, uh, great uh, topic, great discussion. But, you know, this also extends to the handoff at the hospital. Um, I get so many reports from my crews who are standing uh, on the wall or, or, you know, waiting to offload patients. And the, the staff from the hospital will have kind of uh, the same kind of poor attitude toward these patients and, and stuff. So it's not just with EMS, but it really is impactful at the at the uh, uh, at the hospital and, and patients often uh, complain to our medics when the nurses kind of walk away uh, about how bad uh, you know they feel because they're in the condition they're in and uh, the hospital staff kind of uh, picks up on that as well and treats these patients uh, with not uh, not too kind. Well Kim what, what you're saying is like essentially it's almost like taking a patient with abdominal pain to the orthopedic surgeon like it's almost like these people um, we're bringing them to them to a place where they're they're explicitly getting the wrong care because the people there either have this weird concept or they haven't been trained correctly. So um, I, I love that idea about getting the alignment at the hospital level too. Yeah, one one thing I would also just venture is that um, one of the things I did over my career is that I developed relationships with providers and nurses that I thought were were good to patients that uh, were in this situation. Um, and I would often make it my goal to hand the patient off to both the nurse and doctor that was working at that time that I thought would be the best for them. Um, and in this case, actually, that I shared, uh, the, the nurse and the doctor that I was able to hand off to uh, took my sort of, took, took the baton and continued it on. And I think that that, that also makes a huge difference. I'm glad you brought that up is that uh, I actually, one of the pe people who I consulted with on this project delivers a stigma training to nurses uh, across my area of the state in Western Massachusetts. Um, and, and she's kind of taking it from a nursing approach. And so I, I think it complements that, that well, but if you don't have it being done towards nurses, then you would kind of uh, be missing that, that component. So that's a very good point to bring up. Excellent. Well, Stephen, thank you so much. We've reached the bottom of the hour. Uh, Dr. Pepe, go ahead. You're on mute. You did. Sorry about that. So I learned a lot about from Brian Dorries, who did Theater of War, and he started out because he was uh, in hospice with, in a sense, he was a hospice worker for one, his uh, longtime girlfriend who was dying, and then later his father and there's this kind of thing where it, you know you're supposed to be a good person and yet they're treating you because they're dying and they're miserable and they're often treating you badly so there's this thing like well screw you a kind of mentality can come in at the same time you're feeling guilty so when these people come in to me treat you poorly just think about why and um, the circumstances in which they're coming from and try to be patient. Un unlike the hospice person, we don't have to deal with them for real long, but um, you know, but the, I just want to put it in perspective that it could be something along those lines of uh, remembering they're feeling miserable and it's our job to help get them back on track and it's possible. And you, you see it right in front of you. All right, I'm Paul Pepe and I approved this message, right? I'll see you going to the other side. Yes. Today, remember that today's CME was one five three one five one five three one five. Thanks. Thanks for giving the CME there. Okay, Stephen, take care. Bye bye. You're welcome.
Thanks, thanks. thanks Paul. Thanks, Paul. That was great insight. Um, all right, excellent. So um, let's see. Hopefully, Angus is on the on the line. We're going to switch over to the Eagles call. Uh, but Stephen, give us give us your your last words, and um, and I'll I'll be sure to put this recording on our YouTube channel. But uh, take us away and give us your last final thoughts. Yeah, no, I think it was great. Thank you so much for having me. And feel free to reach out uh, by email or Twitter or whatever is easiest for you. And I'm um, very responsive, so I'll get back to you. And and let's try to make a difference for people. Uh, this is why I'm in this field. I, I got burnt out in EMS and I took a change because I wanted to get upstream. And so that's where I am now. And this is the whole purpose of, of what I'm doing. So appreciate Stephen, it. Tell me, tell me your email and I'll type it in real quick. It's Stephen, S-T-E-P-H-E-N dot Murray, M-U-R-R-A-Y at BMC.org. Okay, I put it in the chat for everybody. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, let's see. Let's see if Dr. Jameson is available to take us over to the other side. If not, I'll, I'll try and figure out how to do this from 